Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Curtis Teal. I'm our Twinsburg campus, uh, Twinsburg Macedonia campus minister. I love getting here, hanging out with you guys. Yeah, welcome. Super glad that you're here, hanging out with us. Super glad if you're hanging out with us online at MoChurch.tv. Uh, go ahead and grab your Bibles and open up to John chapter 13. Uh, if you're online with us, go open up a new web page. Go to BibleGateway.com. We'll be using the NIV version. If you're in house today and you don't have a Bible that you feel like you can read and understand, there are some paperbacks at the ends of the rows. If you'll grab those suckers, pass them down, and open up to page 874. Uh, we're going to get to John chapter 13 here in just a little bit. Uh, I've got some things that I, I want to set up real fast because we're going to use some props this morning. Um, I want to introduce you to a couple. Uh, we got a picture for you. Their names are Herbert and Zelmyra Fisher. Uh, here, yeah, here you go. So Herbert and Zelmyra Fisher. So here's, the, here's their story. They, were, they got married uh, May 13th. 1924. Yes, 1924. That's, uh, that's crazy, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty cool. Uh, so here's kind of the deal with Herbert and Zelmyra. Uh, married uh, May 13th, 1924, and in 2010, uh, they were awarded the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest marriage of a living couple. That was 86 years at the time. 86 years. That's crazy. That's really cool. Um, uh, they, uh, uh, Zelmyra passed away a little bit after that, and when she passed away, they ended up uh, being married for a total of 86 years, 290 days. Really, really, really cool. Uh, and so I stumbled upon this, this couple as I was doing some research, because uh, I wanted to know what the longest recorded marriage was that we have in history. And they actually make number three on the list. There's two other marriages that, that, that have lasted, uh, that were longer at least that we have recorded in, in history than, than that one. But what was really cool about uh, these guys is I, I found a, an article on the two of them that kind of like chronicled their marriage. And, and so I started reading about Herbert and Zelmyra, and I'm reading this article, and I, I start thinking to myself, like, I mean, this is a really, really good article. Like, it was, it was even kind of odd that, that that's not something I'm normally impressed with. And so as I'm reading, it's like, man, this is a really like, well-written article. They're asking really good questions. Like, what website, what newspaper am I in? And I look up, and I was on AARP's website, <laughs> which, uh, which I thought was kind of ir ironic and, and, and funny. And then I realized, like, oh, I guess I really don't know ARP, you know? And uh, Yeah, see? Hidden Easter egg there. So uh, in the, the, the article was really good. But inside the article was something that I thought was even cooler. Inside the article, they had a link to their Twitter account. Someone had set up for them a Twitter account, which Herbert and Zelmyra then took over. And what, the reason why they had the, the Twitter account was when they were awarded the, the longest marriage of a living couple, uh, they, uh, someone wanted to set up uh, an account so people could tweet in questions to them and they could answer questions of, of, about their marriage. And there were questions that ranged all kinds of things from things like, were you scared? You know, married 1924, you're on the eve of the Great Depression. It wasn't very long after being married that you go into the Great Depression. Like, how did that affect you guys? You know, uh, questions like, what's your fondest memory? 86 years of being mem uh, married, what's your fondest memory? Uh, things like, uh, man, you two married really young. How did that work? How were you two able to continue to grow as individuals but not grow apart from each other? And, uh, you know, a question like, what's the best piece of advice, and people were tweeting in these questions from all over the world, and Herbert and Zelmyra would, would answer back, and there are two specific questions that stuck out to me that uh, I, I thought were really interesting, and I think contain a big, you know, kind of a big piece of truth that uh, I, I want to hone in on today as we're starting this new series, Great Expectations. And so the first question that really stuck out to me is, what's the one thing, someone tweeted to them, what's the one thing that you two have in common that always keeps you together? Like, what's the one thing that, that kind of spans, you know, any, any kind of a divide or whatever that you guys would have? What's the one thing that keeps you together? And their response was, we're Christians. And if you know anything about Twitter, you only get 140 characters, including spaces. And so a lot of times you've got to send in, like, more than, than, than one tweet to answer. And so they went on to talk about how, uh, essentially saying that because they, they continued to grow in understanding how much God loves them, they were able to continue to grow in love and understanding towards each other. And then the second question, then I thought this one was, I thought this was probably the coolest question that I was able to find in their Twitter feed. And someone asked the question, man, after 86 years, is there anything that you would do differently? 
Is there anything that you would do differently in your marriage? And I got a screenshot of their answer. This is what they said. They said, we wouldn't change a thing. We wouldn't change a thing. There's no secret to our marriage. We just did what was needed for each other and our family. And they went on in another tweet to talk about how they realized the best thing they could do for their kids was model a strong, healthy uh, relationship. I do agree with them, too, with what they said. Like, there's no, there's no real big secret there. But that, that little nugget of truth, I think we often just kind of like simply pass over or we accidentally overlook because we think there should be something bigger that we should be doing. And today as we're starting this new series, I was wisely told one time as I was beginning to or considering going into like doing full-time ministry, I was in contracting world, building houses, remodeling bathrooms, and a preaching mentor of mine told me, Curtis, you should never preach on something you know nothing about. And I'm like, Well, that makes a whole lot of sense. You don't want to stand up in front of somebody and pretend like you know something that you don't know. Uh, But his point was, if you've not lived through something, you shouldn't be teaching about it. And so as we start this new series, Great Expectations, we're, we're really talking about principles that are true in relationships in general, but I think they're especially true when it comes to our marriages. And I realize that as I recognize that as a 30 year old man who's been uh, married for just about eight years, there are many of you in the room who have lived through and seen things and gotten wisdom that, that, that I simply just don't have. Uh, and so this morning, I'm just kind of, I'm unashamedly really just passing on a lesson to you uh, that has been handed to me that I think has really uh, uh, helped my marriage in great, very significant ways. I've been very lucky and very blessed. Uh, with, uh, with couples that, that uh, have been married a long time and for whatever reason have been willing to share their lives with, with me and, and, and my wife and uh, I've just tried to take cues from them and learn from them uh, and this morning I just want to pass on one of those to you because there's a conversation we need to be having in our relationships and I, I'm not sure that we know exactly how to have them and so this morning I, I want to put some images Uh, to a conversation perhaps that maybe you have tried to have in the past and it hasn't gone so well or you haven't really known for sure how to have uh, this conversation. And this week is really just setting us up for the rest of the series. Um, I think one of, if you are a a married person in here this morning, if you are a married Christian, if you are married and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, I think one of the most important things not, maybe not the most, but one of definitely top three important things that we can do in our lives for our world, for our culture, people who do not consider themselves followers of Jesus. I think one of the best things we can do is model amazing marriages. Not just good marriages, not just okay marriages, but absolutely amazing, grace-filled marriages. And so I, I want to try and unpack, try and introduce a conversation that, that we can have that I think can help us move in that direction. So every single one of us, uh, so every single one of us, regardless of whether you know it or not, uh, we carry around with us an invisible box, an invisible box of how we think our relationship, how we think our marriage is going to go. And inside of that box, we put things, hopes, dreams, and desires, things that we feel like our marriage is going to be, things that we feel like our relationship is going to be. And we put all kinds of different things and we expect our relationship to end up something like this. And and, and so we hope that, you know, one of the things that we hope for, whether you realize this or not, but one of the things you've had as your hopes, dreams, or desires is money. When you get into a future relationship uh, is uh, you have hopes, dreams, or desire for how much money you will have, you know. Maybe you think, man, we're going to have a whole lot of money, you know. We're just going to be making it rain, you know. Or, you know, maybe you think we're not going to have a whole lot of money, but we're going to have a, a, a little bit uh, of money. You know, we're going to be a dual income family. We'll be a dual income family, but, uh, you know, we're going to save all of mine. These are hopes, dreams, and desires that maybe you have and you didn't recognize that you have. We have hopes, dreams, and desires. We'll be a dual income family, but, and we're going we're to save all of mine and just live off of his, or we'll just live off of hers, or we're going to be a single income family, and uh, she'll be a stay-at-home mom, or I'll be a stay-at-home dad. Uh, you know, we've got hopes, dreams, and desires. And here's the deal. As we begin to kind of look at some of these, I, I think uh, we've got different ways that, that we look at what's inside 
of these, these boxes. If you're, if you're single, if you're not dating, um, I, I think the things that are inside of our box are probably pretty uh, undefined. But as you move towards a significant relationship, they become much more defined. If you're engaged, I hope that you've begun to talk about what some of your hopes, dreams, and desires are for your marriage with your significant other. And if you're married, I definitely think that you should know what your spouse's or significant other's hopes, dreams, and desires are. You've got hopes, dreams, and desires of things about money, how much you're going to have, dual income, single income, save all of yours, save all of hers. Other things that you have hopes, dreams, and desires about are, are, you know, smaller things, but things you still have hopes and dreams about, like uh, pets, you know? If, right, I know. If I had my way, I would have a desi- dinosaur as a pet. That's not realistic, is what my wife told me. Uh, and so we began having a conversation about uh, getting a cat. And I was like, who wants a cat, Right? <laughs> Uh, and so we settled on a very large dog. I felt that was a good compromise between a dinosaur and, 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 and a cat. Feel like the combination large? No? Okay. Well, we ended up with, 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 a large, with, with, a, with a large dog. But we've got all kinds of things that we hope, dream, and desire about. You've got hopes, dreams, and desires for your future relationship about how chores are going to happen. How you guys like this ostrich duster I found? All right? It's gross. You have hopes, dreams, and desires about how chores are going to happen in, in your house. You know, I'll, I'll, maybe it's for you. Maybe it's, uh, I'll take care of everything inside of the house, but, you know, she'll take care of everything outside of the house, or vice versa. He'll take care of everything outside of the house, and I'll take care of everything, you know, in, in, inside the, the house. Or, you, you know what, I, I, don't really, I, don't, I don't really know. You know, I just, it'll, I just assume it'll all magically happen. That seemed to be what happened in the house that I grew up in, you know. It just, just kind of all magically seems to, to get done you know, anyway, and then uh, moving in, in more of like a, you know, bigger thing, some other like bigger things that we have hopes, dreams, and, and desires about is you've got hopes, dreams, and desires about uh, what each of you will, will drive, you know, big honking manly truck, that's, you know, dream about driving that, you know, for forever, and if you're driving a big manly truck when you started dating, she, she might have started to, you know, she was probably hoping, dreaming, and desiring that, well, uh, you know, one of these days I'll convince him to sell that, and uh, I'm going to convince him to sell it and maybe drive something more practical like, like a minivan, you know. Um, and just for the record, I love my minivan, by the way. Yeah, okay, okay. preach it. Preach it. Um, uh, but, you know, and, and while you're thinking maybe I'll, I'll talk him into being able, willing to, to, to sell that and something more practical like a minivan, he's thinking like, man, if I ever sell my truck, I'm going to get something really practical like a four-wheeler, you know. Have, have fun with friends and be able to, you know, take, take, the, take the kids around. And uh, you've got hopes, dreams, and desires about where you're going to live, you know, little people house. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to rent forever. We're going to rent forever. There's no maintenance, no upkeep. Someone else takes care of all that. And you're like, rent? You know, we're not going to rent. We're going to own. We're going to own and we're going to live, you know, we're going to live downtown so we have access to everything or, or uh, you know, no, we're going to live in the suburbs so we can have access. Like, who wants to be downtown and put up with all that noise and stuff? We still want to be close enough we could, you know, do things in the city but far enough out that we can kind of have our own space or, or maybe your hopes, dreams, and desires are like, man, suburbs, we ain't, we're going to live in the country. Who in the world wants to live somewhere where we could have neighbors, you know? It's, you have hopes, dreams, and desires about what your relationship is going to be like where you're going to live, and then my guess is, is if you have uh, dreamed about being married, uh, you have probably one of these in your hopes, dreams, or desires is a, a child. You thought, man, you know, I, I, I hope that we can have a, a kid together someday, and, and if you're an, uh, an only child, you know, you didn't have any siblings grow up, you probably have thought to yourself, man, I don't want my, my kids to grow up without, well, without siblings. I, I, I want them, I, I, in, in my hopes, dreams, and desires box, I've got children. And then, and then you're like, well, we've got, you know, two girls, so let's just keep going until we have a boy. And, uh, and then you have a third girl. And, uh, uh, and, and, then, and so then you're like, well, we might as well just have a basketball team at this point in time. And you know, but we've got hopes, dreams, and desires about what our, our families will, will, will look like. And, and, then, and, then, and then in this direction, you know, we don't, we don't think about this, you know, quite so much. But we've got hopes, dreams, and desires about how we'll spend our time. 
You know, like, oh, how much time she'll spend with her friends or how much time he'll spend with his friends or uh, we won't spend any time apart. We're just going to spend all of our time, you know, you know, together. That's my hope, dream, and desire. And then you've got hopes, dreams, and desires in regards to the calendar, you know. And uh, when Abby and I, my wife and I, when we got married, I told her, look, I only want three holidays and you can have the rest. Uh, I'd like Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter and the rest are yours, you know, I was like, You can have Groundhog's Day, Flag Day, National Pizza Day, you know, uh, it didn't fly as well as, uh, you guys are laughing, but she was not, she she, she was, uh, and then every guy, every guy, uh, he's got uh, hopes, dreams, and desires about what his wife will or uh, will not wear to bed, you know, we'll just, we'll just leave that conversation right there. And then we have hopes, dreams, and desires about, you know, other serious things, too. Things like, things like this. Conflict resolution. Uh, true story. Uh, these Rock'em Sock'em robots were given to me by the minister that married my wife and I. Um, and just so you know, my wife is very good at Rock'em Sock'em robots, uh, as my minister told me he should, she should be, so... Uh, but we have hopes, dreams, and desires about how we're going to handle conflict in the marriage. You know, we're just, we're going to talk about everything right away. We're just going to get it all out on the table, uh, and we're not going to hold back, just, just put it all out there. Maybe your hopes, dreams, and desires are like, well, no, 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 we're going to take some time. You know, we've got to gather our thoughts. We've got to be careful with what we say. You can't just say everything that you think. I mean, that's how people get hurt. You've got to make sure what you're saying is, is true. You know, maybe that's your hopes, dreams, and desires. And then, and then we've got hopes, dreams, and desires about even bigger stuff. And I don't even have something to illustrate this, but then you have hopes, dreams, and desires of, of like how you're going to treat each other. You know, he, he's never going to say, or man, I'm never going to say, I'm never going to do this in, in, in my marriage, in, in our relationship, or she's never going to say, or she's never going to do this. And we've got hopes, dreams, and desires about how we're going to treat each other in, in our marriage. You see, we all, and here's the thing, we all, even unconsciously, We've got hopes, dreams, and desires about how our relationship, our marriage, is going to go. And here's where it gets really tricky. See, when we get married, uh, or when you move in the direction of a significant relationship, what we do is we take our box of hopes, dreams, and desires, and we say, here you go. We swap boxes. We hand it to the other person in the relationship and we say, here, make these come true. But the problem is, and the tension is, that when we hand off our hopes, dreams, and desires to the other persons, to them, it doesn't feel like hopes, dreams, and desires, does it? To them, it feels more like expectations. To them, it feels more like the bar has been set. An expectation is this. An expectation is a strong belief that something will happen or will be the case in the future. You know, I, I know he still has fill in the blank, but he, he'll sell it. I, I know we're still not there yet, but we'll get there, right, honey? And for them, it no longer feels like hopes, dreams, and desires. To them, it feels like expectations, like the bar has been set. And if you fall short of that bar, then you are disappointed not only in me, but in our marriage. And then the thought begins to become, this is not what I thought it would be. This is not what I signed up for. And so we begin to think and process ideas like, I'm out or I give up. In the book, Fighting for Your Marriage, which has been a great resource for me for this series, it says that, uh, it says talking specifically about expectations, it says that you don't have to be fully aware of the expectations to have them affect your relationship. In general, you will be disappointed or happy based on how well your perceptions of what you expected are meeting what is actually happening. You see, what happens is, in many cases, is we do not make space in our relationship to talk about these things. And even worse, what typically happens is we haven't taken the time to figure out what our own hopes, dreams, and desires are for the expectation, or, or, or for our marriage, for our relationship. So we haven't taken the time to figure out what we put in our box. We don't think about those things. So what do we do? What do we do? 
Do we just give up on our hopes, dreams, and desires and give in to what our spouse wants? Right? Just become the person our spouse wants us to be? Just, just live out the hopes, dreams, and desires of our spouse? I mean, because that's what makes people happy, right? Like, no, that's not a good idea. Do we try and then maybe convince our spouse or our significant other uh, to live out our hopes, dreams, and desires? You know, like, hey, you've got the wrong box, honey. You should be living out of my box. Or, or maybe another option is to just complain about it. Just complain about it behind their backs and, and put up with it, assuming that this is as good as marriage gets. And I don't think any of those are good options. I don't think any of those are what marriage is supposed to be like, what the Bible pictures marriage being like. And here's the deal. The bottom line for all of our relationships, but especially with marriages, this relationship and this, this, this idea about how we go about filling our hopes, dreams, and desire gets flipped on its head in the Bible. Uh, in, a letter, in a letter to another church, a guy named Paul, a guy named Paul writes a letter to a church in uh, Philippi, a, a place, and, and in this letter he's talking specifically about relationships. And what he says I think is really important, kind of sets the stage for how this relationship hierarchy gets flipped on its head. He says this uh, in Philippians 2 verses 3 through 5, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking out to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So he really highlights a couple of things here. He said, man, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Value others above yourself. Not looking out for your own interests, but have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Jesus. And this, and this idea, this thought, this phrase, having the mindset of Christ Jesus begins to pop up a couple different places in a couple different like, books in our Bible where there were letters written about marriages and about relationships. It says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So the question that we need to ask is, what's the mindset of Jesus? Like, as, you know, as 1980s as it sounds, is what would Jesus do? And so in this story, John 13, which we're going to look at today, we're going to read two verses, and then I'm going to tell you the context in which this takes place and why it's so significant to our hopes, dreams, and desires. In John 13, verse 34, Jesus is teaching, and this is what he says. He kind of pauses, he sat down, he's having this meal with his 12 closest followers, his 12 closest students. He sits down and he says this, he says, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And we need some context for this story because there's something really significant happening here. Jesus is within hours. Okay, he's, he's hung out with these 12 guys, his disciples. He's hung out with them for about three years now, teaching them by showing them, not only by words, but showing them by example what it looks like to really love God and love people. He's done that for three years now. And at this moment, when he teaches this, he is within hours of being taken prisoner, arrested, charged of crimes he did not commit, and then eventually being executed by being hung on the cross. And so this is kind of like his last opportunity, his like farewell speech to these guys, but they don't really recognize it before all this bad stuff begins to happen. This meal that they've sat down and are having is something that they call the Passover meal. And for them, it's a very, very, very big deal. I kind of, I struggled to kind of find what, a modern day equivalent to it. And, and the best example I could come up with is like Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner. Uh, but that still doesn't elevate it quite to like the big deal level that it was for them. So these 12 students, they were, you know, good Jewish boys, and what they would have this big meal called the Passover meal, where they'd sit down and, as like a thank you to God for all the things that they have done for him. So they sit down for this big meal that they've been preparing for for days, maybe weeks, and Jesus begins to teach them, and he begins teaching them with saying the phrase, a new command that I give to you, to us. It's not a big deal, right? Like, this is Jesus. Of course, he can sit down and he can say, like, a new command that I give to you. But for them, this would have been, like, borderline offensive to them. Because, see, these 12 guys sitting around them, raised as good Jewish boys, they were raised under the premise of the Old Testament, 
which is like the first half, the pre-Jesus part of our Bible. And they were taught 636 commands of how to have a good relationship with God. Uh, that these 636 commands were given by a guy named Moses, uh, which was a very big deal to them. And, and there were There are all kinds of things you could do with the commands. You could teach about the commands. uh, You could study the commands. uh, You could debate about how to apply the commands in your life. But one thing you could not do was you could not add to the commands and you could not take away from the commands. And Jesus starts his lesson with a new command that I give to you. They would have sat up in their seats and they would have been like, what is he doing? And he says, a new command I give you that you love one another. And they would have responded like, Jesus, that's not new. And he would have said that I'm not through. A new command I give you that you love one another as I, he finishes it out there with as I have loved you. Now just before they sat down for dinner and and Jesus, they had been hanging out with him for three years and each of them could have gone around the room and told individual stories about how Jesus sacrificially loved them, but they had all 12 just experienced it. Because before they started this meal, they sat down and Jesus took a basin of water and a towel and he went around and he washed all 12 of his disciples' feet, including a man named Judas, who would be the guy who would go out and sell him, accuse him falsely, lie about him, that would lead to Jesus' execution. And he went around and he washed all 12 of these guys' feet. Now think about how nasty their feet would have been, right? It's hot. It's hot out, they, they walk everywhere, they wear sandals, there's dirt, like nobody's walking down the street and getting a pedicure, you know, like these feet are nasty. But Jesus goes and he washes all 12 of their feet and it's a big deal because Jesus is flipping the relational hierarchy of this like, relationship. In fact, he comes to a guy named Peter and Peter actually refuses to let Jesus wash his feet at first. And Peter's revealing to us his expectation of how the relationship is supposed to work. For Peter, it was, Jesus is up here. Jesus, we serve you, and we've got people under us, and they serve us. But Jesus says, no, 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 that's not how this works. Let me show you how this works. And he flips it on his head, and he says, we're here for each other. We serve each other. A new command I give you that you love one another. One of the best, one, a really good application that I think you should go home with today is I think this week, sometime this week, you should read all of chapter 13 uh, of, of the book of John. John chapter 13, page uh, 874 in your Bible. I think you should go home and read it and read this story because he flips the relational hierarchy and, and where Peter's like, no, we're here for you, we serve you, you don't serve us. Jesus says, no, 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 we're here for each other. We love each other. And I realized something, if we play out this metaphor, if we play out this metaphor to our relationships, to our marriages, I I, I realized we spend most of our time hoping, dreaming, desiring about the times in our marriage when we marry the person that's going to wash our feet. We, We dream, and like playing out this metaphor, we hope and dream and desire and think about the times when our spouse will wash our feet. We do not spend time thinking about washing our spouse's feet washing our significant other feet. In in other words, we dream about marrying the perfect person for us. We do not spend time dreaming about becoming the perfect person for the one we marry. But we should. And there's a very big difference there. Check out how this pops up in the rest of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 and 5. It says this. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Man, I've read it, read it many different weddings, and it should be. It's considered one of the, the, probably the greatest written definition of love. And things that it highlights is being patient with one another. Man, that's not easy to do, right? It, it, it doesn't boast. Hey, my box is better than your box. It's not self-seeking. Hey, we should live out my hopes, dreams, and desires. And this isn't going to be the last time that this pops up. Romans 12, verse 9 and 10 says this about relationships. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Over the last several years, and I I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just like the the, the time we're in. I don't know if it's because of like the the age we're at, but a lot of my friends, 
Uh, friends that I, I went to, to, to college with, friends that my wife and I went to college with, uh, friends that we know from home, have just really, like, just lately been struggling a lot with their marriages. Uh, and, and so my wife and I have sat down at different times to kind of talk with the couples, kind of help them out, you know, try to kind of understand what's going on and how we can be a help and, and pray for them. And a phrase began to pop up every time we'd sit down and we'd talk with these, these uh, couples, and it popped up in different places, and I couldn't figure out why it bothered me, but this phrase always really bothered me. And the phrase was, as we'd sit down and we'd start talking with them, they'd say, but Curtis, you don't understand, we're devoted to our marriage. Uh, Curtis, you don't understand, we believe in our marriage, we're committed to our marriage. And I couldn't figure out why that didn't sit well with me, because it sounds so good, right? I mean, that sounds like what we're supposed to do. And finally, I read this verse, and I heard a preacher talking about it, and I realized, like, that's why it doesn't sit well with me. And I realized, and I told Abby, I said, look, I don't want you to be devoted to our marriage. I want you to be devoted to me. I don't want you to be committed to our marriage. I want you to be committed to me. Because, right, I mean, nobody marries a marriage, right? Nobody dates a relationship. You date a person. You marry a person. We're to be devoted to one another. We're to honor one another above ourselves. Ephesians 4.2 says this, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. I don't know what picture you get when you hear the phrase bearing with one another, but the picture I get is, is like two people kind of continually learning about each other and, and kind of putting up with each other as we learn new things that we hope, desire, and dream about. You know, as, as you learn new things, as you learn new nuances about them, and both of you are kind of bearing with each other, but both are going to make strides at becoming better at loving and supporting each other because you want to be devoted to one another, because you want to bear with one another, you want to learn things about each other. It's kind of this continual learning process of what we hope and dream and desired our relationship to be. Uh, Abby and I, my wife and I, we got married in July of 2010. Uh, we were both at the time uh, living in two different states, moving to a different state. Uh, we were moving to Maryland. I was finishing up an internship here at, at Momentum. And um, uh, my wife was leaving a teaching job she had in Tennessee to take a teaching job in Maryland where we would be living. And uh, one of the things that we, uh, I did not realize, uh, one of the things that was in uh, my box or hopes, dreams, and desires about how life would look like is uh, I love to spend my time competing, playing sports. Uh, in college, it was, in ba it was baseball, uh, but being graduated from college now, my baseball days were over, and it was time for me to move in the direction of old man slow pitch softball. And, uh, and I loved it. I, I, I love old man slow pitch, uh, slow pitch softball. Mike Bonanno, our guy playing saxophone for me, he was getting on my case earlier about calling it old man slow pitch softball. Uh, he plays on a team called Huff and Puff, which I think is awesome. <laughs> I, I asked him if I could play with him sometime. He told me I was, I was not old enough yet. Um, but So I started playing old man slow pitch softball and when we moved to Maryland. And uh, my wife, you know, came and watched the game. She'd sit in the bleachers and she'd watch me. And so I got invited to play on a, a rec league one night. And that led to me being invited to play on a rec league another night, which then led from me being invited to play a co-ed league on another night, which then led to me being invited to play, like, travel tournaments on the weekend where we'd go and play for, like, trophies and money. Like, guys, we were taking this way too seriously, and I was loving it. Uh, and, and Abby was coming and she was watching me, and I thought, man, this is awesome. I'm getting to do what I love. I'm getting to play it like every night of the week. And my bride, who I love, is loving coming watching me play. And I finished a game one night, and I got invited to come play in a tournament that weekend. And on the ride home, I told Abby, I said, hey, I got invited to play another tournament this weekend. And she said, are you ever going to say no to one of those things? And I said, I thought you loved this. And she said, I know you love it. You see, and that kind of set the table for the very first time where we had a realistic conversation as a new, young, married couple about where our expectations were not meeting reality, where our hopes, dreams, and desires weren't matching up with what we thought this or would be, or what we thought this would be was not matching up with what was actually happening, and it was causing tension, it was causing conflict. And a really cool thing 
uh, that this book, Fighting for Your Marriage, highlights, it highlights that different expectations are not what cause uh, relationship problems. It's not what, uh, it's not, uh, different expectations in a relationship is not the problem. The problem is not realizing each other's expectations and finding mutually acceptable ways of fulfilling those expectations. And so here's the deal. Before, before we can figure out how to meet each other's expectations, how to help each other achieve hopes, dreams, and desires of what the relationship would be, is we have to know what our own hopes, dreams, and desires are. And so here's my homework for you this weekend, and this is really, honestly, this is just setting the table for next week. Dan, our lead minister, is going to be here, and he's going to be helping us uh, unpack this. What you need to go home today is you need to go home today and answer the question, what's in your box? What are your hopes for what your relationship would have been, or would be? What are your dreams? What do you desire? And, and I had a difficult time trying, like I sat down, I was like, if, if I'm going to teach about this, I've got to be willing to do it. Uh, and so I had kind of a tough time thinking through it, everything, kind of like, okay, here, blank piece of paper. Outside in the lobby, when you go out those double doors, there's a CD rack, there was like the merch table where all the t-shirts are. On there, there's a, a, a one piece of paper, front and back, and on there, it's just a ton of questions. There's an exercise in the book, Fighting for Your Marriage, where it goes through and it just lists a bunch of different questions to help you figure out what's in your box. What did you hope your marriage would be? What do you dream your marriage will be? What do you desire your marriage to be? And my homework for you this week is to go home, take some time, and work through that worksheet. And here's the deal. My one, my one rule for this is, do not talk to your significant other or your spouse this week about it, all right? I know some of you sitting in this room right now are already planning the conversation on the way home. Do not do that. Take this week, take your worksheet, take some serious time, pray about it, and, and go through this worksheet to figure out what's in your box. Do not talk about it. Give it time, give it prayer, give it effort, and then come back next week as we unpack what to do with our great expectations. Let's pray. God, we love you. Uh, God, thank you for loving us. Um, God, thanks for this example uh, of Jesus in, uh, in the Bible about what uh, this relationship hierarchy uh, could look like. God, give us wisdom as we unpack uh, what we've hoped and dreamed and desired marriage to be like. Uh, this week, God, give us clarity as we think through kind of what we expected it to be, um, uh, God, uh, and bring us back next week uh, so we can figure out how to take a step forward and moving in the direction of having an amazing marriage. God, I know you want that for us. You don't want us to just have an okay marriage. You want us to have great marriages. Um, so God, be with us uh, this week as we do that. It's in your son's holy and awesome name we pray. Amen.